Okay, my name is Angela Ackridge, and I am the Regulatory and Planning Director for the Metropolitan Sewer District. And what we're going to be talking to you tonight is about stream water quality and uh, public health and safety that can sometimes suffer because of overflows. You know, we're very blessed in Louisville that we have lots of water and that it is most often clean and able for us to go out and do the activities that we enjoy in our community. But sometimes there are things that happen that prevent that water from being as safe as it could be or should be or from where it originally was when Louisville was first settled. There are times that we have things that occur that's in the picture, which is a sewer overflow that can compromise the safety of that water and the quality of that water when these things occur. Sometimes it's in the street. Sometimes it's in the creek, but either way, the situation is the same. In these waters are bacteria that if you come in contact with that or ingest that, it can make you sick. And it's not just the sewer overflows, it's the trash and the debris that you'll also find in these streams and those water bodies that will make you sick also. So what we're here tonight to talk about is why do sewers overflow? What is MSD doing to protect public health and safety that could be hindered by those overflows? And then what the public can do to also help in the protection of the community. So before Louisville was settled, before we had Western migration, this was a naturally uh, occurring land with streams and water that flowed out to the Ohio River or to Beargrass Creek. And it was totally clean, totally safe. And then this happened. This is an actual picture of Louisville in the 1800s where when you have so many people crowded into an area without a lot of processes in place to deal with waste, waste finds a way out of the living space and into the common areas you can see here. And so it was pet waste and animal manure and chamber pots and garbage and anything that you can think of, it went out into the street. So when it rained, that would just be a cesspool that people would have to walk through. And that would be carried away out into the river or into Beargrass Creek. And this is the reason that sewers were built in the Louisville area. And so you can see some of the pictures here, the original sewers when Louisville was uh, at the time only 43,000. And so now we're about 750,000. So we've grown tremendously. These sewers, by the way, are still in place. So what happens? So it rains and we build these sewers, we carry the stormwater away, but it's also carrying that waste because that waste is still out in the street. So now that waste has an even easier way to get out away from people, but it goes right into the Ohio River. Now this is before treatment of any kind. And so your first sewers were very crude. They did their job, but it was basically a creek with some whatever they could find, wood or some type of material that was built on top of that. But they did work because what we saw is typhoid and cholera rates drastically decreased when these sewers were being put in. So it was eliminating the uh, disease that would be around people in those types of situations. In 1860, when the Louisville Water Company was able to put water into homes and buildings, then we created more issues of the same. We had running water, but now we had to figure out how to get that waste out because it was now coming in in very frequent uh, supplies. And so the chamber pot method doesn't seem like such a good idea anymore. And so we had to figure out what to do. Well, there's these huge sewers out in the street. They just so happened to be storm sewers that were there for rainwater, not wastewater. But they connected those homes and those businesses to those same pipes because that's all there was. And remember where that was going. That was going straight to Beargrass Creek and the Ohio River. So now it's untreated waste that's going straight out to the river because treatment didn't exist yet. And then here's one of the more advanced sewers that was built. Again, this sewer is still in operation. This was uh, built at the time then when the Louisville was expanding and we were not treating stormwater, we were just moving stormwater. So these big pipes were in place anticipating the stormwater needs that would come. 
And these do, uh, they still get used and they still fill up in, in big rainwater events. So in 1948, the Federal Water Pollution Control Act requires that treatment plants go in place. But it wasn't until 1958 that the first treatment plant was actually built in Louisville, and that was Fort Southworth, Fort, Fort Southworth, or the Morris Forman Wastewater Treatment Plant that's still in existence today. It's the largest treatment plant in the state of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And it was built, but the sewers had to be to that. So if you'll notice that same big pipe that was there, that was the creek. And so all of the storm pipes that went to that, well, they had to put a smaller pipe in underneath that big pipe and that would convey that flow to the treatment plant. So they had to put weirs in those pipes before that water would outlet out to the creek and put a hole in the bottom of that pipe by that weir so the flow would come in, hit that weir, drop down into the pipe, and then go to the treatment plant for treatment. But that's only for sewage, because if you notice the size of those lines, the size of the line going to the treatment plant is smaller than the size of the pipe going out to the creek, because that was the creek. And so you, we knew that we couldn't treat the entire creek that was going through there, only the wastewater part of that. So what resulted, what water couldn't go to the treatment plant went over the weir untreated out into Beargrass Creek or the Ohio River. Those are what we call a combined sewer overflow. That's how they became part of the Louisville sewer system. And every sewer system here east of the Mississippi River, these river cities, this is the same technology of how sewers progressed. And so this is a picture of different, uh, a large CSO, a small CSO. There's about 100 of them still active right now along the Three Forks of Beargrass Creek on the Ohio River. So in 1955, the state of Kentucky bans further construction of combined sewers. We go to totally separate sanitary sewers for the household industrial weights and totally separate stormwater systems for the rainwater that comes off the house and off the buildings and off the ground and to move that away. However, the way that these were built and the time frames that they were built from 1955 to the 1980s, MSD was not in a position to uh, oversee that. We were not the overseeing body, and so a lot of those were built without that strict oversight, and so they weren't built very well. The state also came in during that time and asked MSD to take over a lot of those systems that were built because they were failing. And so they needed someone to take those over and to help get them back into proper repair. So from 1985 to 2003, MSD extended sewers to all of Jefferson County in essence. That, that is served, we extended those, and that meant taking over a lot of those treatment systems that were not built very well, that were uh, failing in some way, shape, or form. And so this is what you see. You see cracks in the pipe. You see places where the pipe may have separated. A lot of these pipes were made out of old clay, vitrified pipe. So if you have a clay pot, a terracotta pot, you know that when it dries out, if you would even slightly nudge it, it could crack. And if it hits the ground for sure, it's going to crack and break. Well, it's very brittle. And the same is true of the sewers that were built out of the same material. And so as the ground moves, as you have freeze and thaw effect in the wintertime, and uh, as you have root intrusion that goes and seeks the nutrients that's going to be in that sewer pipe, it's going to crack those pipes open, wedge them open as those roots grow, and then more and more water can get in there. The same thing happens. The same thing happens on the separate side, or on the... Um, On the private side of that, so MSD maintains up into the right of way. And what most people don't know is that the homeowner is responsible for that sewer pipe that comes from the house to the right of way. That's a private sewer that's supposed to be maintained by the homeowner or the business owner, whosoever that is. And the same types of problems can occur. It's the same type of pipe. You're still going to have the cracks. You can have downspouts connected and sometimes connected into that sewer pipe that aren't supposed to be there. Now. MSD would like to help as much as possible because a lot of times this is happening, it's an expense, it's not something that you've planned for, you've got sewage in your basement nine times out of ten, and so it's something that has to be fixed. And so we have a program that we will help in financing that repair that needs to be done. And you can talk to the folks uh, at the desk as you leave, they have packets on that information if that's something that you'd like to get more information on. 
You also see at times where you have this situation here, which is uh, a sewer out in the street and it's overflowing. And what we see, again, it's got too much stormwater that's in there from those cracks in the pipe, from those holes in the manholes that could be there. And so there are some things that we can do as homeowners and as business owners to help in this situation, things that you've never thought about before until today, most likely. And one of those is that when it's raining, when those pipes are already full, if you can uh, take an opportunity to not run your washing machine or not run your dishwasher during that time frame, then you're keeping water out of a pipe that's already full and overflowing somewhere. By running those large water sources, we're literally pushing water out somewhere else. It could be pushing into somebody's basement. It could be pushing it out into the street. It could be pushing it out into the creek. But it's something that you don't know is happening because it might be down the street. It might be around the corner. It might be a mile away. But all of those houses going into that one pipe are going to contribute to that. And this is something no one ever wants to have happen. And that's when you have sewage that's going to back up into a basement. And it's probably one of the worst things that could ever happen. And there's some things that each of us can do to keep it from happening to us or keep it from happening to our neighbor. And again, things that you've never thought of that uh, if it doesn't belong in the toilet, put it in the trash. So uh, dental floss, rags, flushable wipes. They say flushable, but they're not flushable. Uh, diaper wipes, diapers, any of those things, hair from your hairbrush that you're cleaning out, any of that, please refrain from putting it in the toilet and put it in the trash because what happens is it finds its way down the system to our pump stations and it winds itself around the pumps and then all of a sudden that pump will stop pumping. And so when a sewage pump stops pumping, sewage stops flowing down. And when it stops flowing down, it's going to back up and that result is either in somebody's home or into the street or both. Something else, this is something that we, we do, we are pretty cognizant of this, but we just want to make sure that everybody understands that even though that uh, it, it may be rumored that if you turn the hot water on and run it for like 10 minutes at a time that you could take your grease that you were cooking with or anything that you uh, might not got off your plates and put it in the sink and it'll go away. Well, it might go away. It might leave your sink. If you're really lucky, it might leave your house. But when it hits the street, it's going to... Uh, cool off a little bit and when it cools it's going to gel up and once it uh, gels up it's going to have a solid blockage in the street somewhere and again MSD is not going to know that this has happened until the worst occurs. Somebody's going to have a backup into their basement or multiple people are going to have backups into their basement and so that's the only times that we can find these types of things. So what we're asking folks to do is take a paper towel and totally scrape your plates and your dishes, your cookware, everything into the trash. Don't use your garbage disposal down the trash and then you can safely put those dishes in the sink or the dishwasher. And then at the worst is we see something like this where we have geysers that are along the creek and, and all of this water is finding its way out. And that happens when we have lots of stormwater connections onto that pipe in a neighborhood and multiple neighborhoods that are sending massive amounts of water and what we normally see is that it's going to be groundwater sump pumps that are taking water away from foundations of homes and that are shoving it into the sanitary pipe that's a smaller pipe that's trying to carry that sewer waste away and all of those sump pumps are robbing that sewer pipe of the waste capacity and putting storm water in that and this is the result that you see. Same thing for downspouts. Uh, inside the Waterson Expressway in the combined sewer system is where we see most of that, is where we're, because originally the downspouts were put into the ground because that was the drainage system. But now we're asking folks again to take those and turn them out onto the ground, let it run across the grass, let it soak into the soil so that that's not going straight into the sewer system and causing those problems. So the map that you see here is a map of the county and the blue dots are the combined sewer overflow location. So you see them along the three forks of Beargrass Creek and all along the waterfront there on both sides, the north and the west, that's the Ohio River. And the inner ring there is the Waterson Expressway, the outer ring is the uh, Gene Snyder Freeway. And so what you can see is all those green dots, those are sanitary sewer overflow. So that area that's supposed to be separate sanitary sewer and separate stormwater sewer, we know we still have these sanitary sewer overflows that are plaguing the streets and the creeks and basement backups. And so what the one takeaway from this map is that there's no area of Jefferson County that's not subject to sewer overflows of some type. 
So we've, we have ourselves in a situation where we have a community-wide problem that required a community-wide solution. And MSD put that solution together. It does come with a big price to that. That price is $850 million. It's second only to the Bridges Project that we have ongoing now in this community. And so here's what's happened. And the timeline that you see from 1985 to 2003, that's the time frame that MSD spent uh, eliminating those failing treatment plants, those failing septic systems, of putting sewers in the ground, of trying to get rid of those everyday violations and health problems that existed in this community from those systems that didn't work. We were also doing work on these overflows. We were just trying to balance the cost and the time of doing both of those. EPA came in and said, uh, we understand what you're doing, we understand why you're doing that, but we need you to work on these overflow situations faster than you've been doing that, which means spending money at a faster rate. So in 2005, we signed an agreement with EPA in the state of Kentucky to put a plan in place, this $850 million plan that would alleviate those overflows faster uh, than we were currently on schedule to do. And what that plan says is that um, by the year 2020, all of the work that's planned in the combined sewer system, the area inside the Waterston Expressway where those original sewers were built, that work has to be completed by 2020. And the work outside the Waterston Expressway in the separate sanitary sewer system has to be complete by the year 2024, December 2020 and December 2024. So that's the schedule that we're mandated to work through. So here's the types of projects that we're doing. A lot of this that we saw, we're doing pipe rehabilitation, we're doing uh, basins as we're talking about here this evening. We're doing treatment plan expansions, treatment plan improvements. We're doing downspout disconnections. The, uh, the picture that you see here looks to be at first glance that that's a house that's on fire. And actually what it is, it's a house whose downspout is connected to the sewer. And when we go in and test that sewer to see if that sewer has leaks, the way you do that on a dry day is put smoke down in that sewer. And anywhere that that smoke rises, is where you see there's either a, a crack in the pipe or in the ground that's allowing air and water to come through there, or in this case, you find a pipe that's connected to the sewer pipe. And so those rain, rainwater downspouts on that house, every time it rains, that water's going straight from that roof, straight into the sewer, and contributing to those overflows that we saw in the picture that we have. And so we're going through and, and working collectively area by area to try to remove as many of those sources as we can. So in terms of progress, where we are, where we've been working since uh, uh, 2005, you can see the numbers of projects that we finished, how many are currently in design or construction, and overall what we have, which are about 48% complete and tracking just slightly under budget. So we're very pleased as to where we are on the schedule and on the cash flow from what we projected back when we submitted that plan in 2009 and, and the plan that we're moving forward with. So here's our schedule. So you can see where we started. You can see there's two lines there. We actually submitted a modification in uh, 2012 to EPA in the state of Kentucky that says we've been monitoring this area. We've been looking at uh, the projects that we've got in place, the projects that we've been finished. We put more and more sewer monitors in the ground to actually understand what was going on, where that water was moving to, away from, and, and what the result was. And what we were able to do is modify some projects so that we could get that work done faster and at the amount of, about the same amount of money, but that we could also get more benefit. So we removed more of that bacterial laden water. We removed it at a faster rate for the same price that we originally put forward. So we're very proud of that uh, ability to do that. And the EPA and the federal government didn't, or the federal government didn't ask us to do that. We proactively looked at what we could do to better protect the community and our citizens here. And so that's the program that we put forward. And so here's just the progress on the separate sewer system. That's where we started. EPA mandated that we start at the worst sanitary sewer overflow locations, those areas where 70% of the wet weather volume was uh, pretty much congregated in those older neighborhoods. And so that's where those overflows started. It's a huge problem. It's a huge uh, solution that's required. It didn't happen overnight. And so whereas it appears that that progress may be slow, it's, it's going to, something that's going to take some time, which is what takes us to 2020 and 2024. So let's talk just a little bit about rates, because we can't talk about $850 million without talking about the money that it's going to take to fund that. And as you know, it's not from taxes. It's from the rate base. It's from, the, it's from those of us, all of us that live here in Jefferson County, and, and money that we pay every other month uh, through our water bill. That's where this money comes from. And so we had to put a plan together 
that would show how we would fund this. That was one of the requirements that uh, the federal government had for us, is to make sure that we could pay for the work that we would be doing to alleviate this problem. And so the, what you could see up here is Louisville's rates, um, or actually that's the cost per sewer mile that we have for the work that we're doing. So as you can see, where we are on the low end of the scale from all the other consent decree cities in the area, that we're at least half the cost of other plans uh, that we have going in this particular area. So when we talked about we're putting a plan that's cost effective and that's going to take as much of that water out, that, that pollutant-laden, bacteria-laden water for the cost, we're very proud of this cost that we have. And again here, there's the, the cost that it, in terms of a rate uh, per month that we have. You can see where we are in terms of the national average and the surrounding community. So we're trying very hard to keep that rate affordable, but maintain the schedule that uh, EPA is required of us to have. We do have a program for those that are 65 or older and meet the criteria of, that's on the screen there that we can um, uh, assist ever so slightly with the cost of that program. And so again, there are senior citizen discount forms that are outside at the customer service desk. If, if it applies to you or someone that you know, you can take those back to them and uh, fill those out and return those to us and we can help uh, just a little bit in that area. So this is where we started. So we've come a long way. We've got a long way to go. We talked about there's two sides. There's the private side or the, the, the homeowner side of that line and there's the public side. It truly is a partnership. It's gonna take both entities. It's gonna take the homeowner and the business owner. It's gonna take MSD and what we do to be able to solve this problem as we go forward because it is a multi-pronged approach. But what we'd like to leave here today with knowing that we can do this together we can get uh, community here in Louisville with all the water that we're blessed with, that it's safe, that we can enjoy this water, all the parks that we have, our kids can go safely play and recreate and not have to worry about the bacteria that might be in there. So at this point, you've got this. And on the back of your little blue sheet is some information that you can take home with you that would have this information should you need to call MSD. If you see anything that looks like this, please call us that, uh, and report that information to us so that we can make sure that we respond to that. On the front of that sheet is your little quiz questions that you have. If we want to make sure we go through there, it says MSD's authority to perform sewer maintenance extends to the right of way. So that's that point where the public sewer and the private sewer meet. We'd like for you to avoid using the washing machine and dishwashers when it's raining, if at all possible. To not flush dental floss, hair wipes, not even wipes that say they are flushable. We didn't talk a lot about fog, but fog is fats, oils, and greases, so it's all the things that we cook with and that's gonna be in our kitchen or, or things that we want to make sure that we discard them in the trash and not put them down the drain. Sump pumps, if you've got a groundwater sump pump in your basement around your foundation, we need to make sure that those either outlet onto the ground or that they go into the storm sewer and not into the sanitary sewer. And we do have a program, again, we can get information out of the desk that will help to correct that situation if that exists in your particular home. And then ensure downspouts go into the ground and not into the, uh, the sanitary system. So at that point, if you've got questions, if you could kindly write them on the little sheets of paper that you were given, and we'll have somebody come around and we will collect those and we will answer those in between or at the end of the next presentation. There's a website here where you can get that information if you wanna get more, it's on your little blue sheets. To, so all the information that we had here today. The transcripts of these particular presentations are all up there too, so you can see all the past presentations that we've done, all the materials that we've done will be there that you can uh, go back there and see.
appreciate the work and the Okay, we're going to move to the second presentation tonight, and this one is about a specific project in the consent decree. This is a project called the Clifton Heights CSO Basin. I want to do some turning around here because I lost my monitor here, so I need to look, be looking back at, at the screen occasionally. Uh, my name is Steve Emley. I'm the chief engineer for MSD, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the necessity for this basin, the background behind it, um, a little bit of history about the, about the area in particular, some of the challenges that we've got with this particular project. Starting off, if you've, if you've ever been to our Project WIN website, this is one of a series of projects that that's identified both descriptively and on mapping that shows kind of a, a conceptual outline of what this is proposing. Not a lot of detail, and that is basically where we are today in terms of planning. So the bad news is that if you came here tonight looking for a lot of detail about what this, what this is going to look like, we're not going to be able to share that with you. The, the good news is that we're coming out uh, ahead of design on these projects so that, so that we can get feedback from the public on the front end of the, of the, of the, of the design so that we're not getting uh, pretty far into the design. We've already made some, some critical decisions that the community hasn't had an opportunity to input in. So we're getting out ahead of this. We, we do not actually have a, a design firm under contract to work on this basin. So the first thing we're trying to do on this basin and then most of the other CSO basins in the system is to get out, identify the key stakeholders in the community, the surrounding neighborhoods of these basins, try to get as much input as we can on the front end before we move into the detailed design. So this gives you just, just, just a little idea of what that schedule looks like. Angela mentioned that all of the work in the combined system has to be complete by December of 2020. This particular project by EPA uh, requirements needs to be in place by December of 2018. So we have quite a bit of time uh, to work on this. It's not one of the larger CSO basins, so, so from that standpoint, we're not really pushed in a corner in terms of schedule, and we have some time to get out in front of this and have some uh, active involvement with the community. Angela talked a little bit about the history of the sewer system, and if you can just imagine living in a city where all of your the waste from your home, waste from distilleries, from tanneries, from uh, slaughterhouses, is all being discharged either to the street or to the river or to uh, one of the tributaries of Beargrass Creek. It's almost unimaginable that, that you would live like that. But that was the condition that we had in, in, in Louisville in the 1800s. So beginning in 1906, uh, the first commissioners of sewers, sewers were put into place. Uh, the, the, the conditions had gotten so bad in Louisville that the, the voters actually voted for a $4 million bond issue to begin the work of building a comprehensive sewer system in Louisville. So in that first uh, bond issue, it was a $4 million bond issue, and the, the commissioners have put together a pretty detailed, comprehensive plan to, to begin providing that comprehensive sewer system for the city. So as part of that, a 36-inch uh, trunk sewer was built up what is Edwards Pond Branch, which is an old creek that used to run up pretty much follows the, the alignment of Brownsboro Road. Now that area looks very, very different now. 
And it wasn't very long before that sewer, although it was large compared to nothing, uh, it was very small compared to the overall watershed. It was an area that was de developing very, very rapidly, and uh, it was overwhelmed almost immediately. So in 1919, the second commission were, were called into action, and there were three bond issues that funded that work by the second commissioners. There was a $2 million bond issue, a $5 million bond issue, and a $10 million bond issue. And with those bonds, they continued that expansion uh, of the sewers in the city of Louisville. And as part of that, they, they built a much larger trunk sewer that basically paralleled that original 36-inch sewer uh, up, in, up in the area along Brownsboro Road. And keep in mind, all of this waste is still going directly to either the Ohio River or to Beargrass Creek. So no treatment, no flood protection. And uh, the, the intent here is really to get it away from citizens, get it away from homes, and even get it away from Beargrass Creek. The commissioners were advanced enough where they realized they needed to not just get it to a creek, they needed to get it to the Ohio River. So they built interceptors along the tributaries of Beargrass Creek to convey dry weather flow to the Ohio River and allowed wet weather flow t uh, to remain discharging to Beargrass Creek. So then 1937, we had our flood of record, um, a huge impact to the city of Louisville, and it began the discussions of building a flood protection system around Louisville. And one of the reasons I wanted to cover this is because you have, if you ever spend a lot of time driving around this particular area, as all of you probably do, there are some pretty unique structures that you drive by probably every day um, in terms of what was built with our flood protection system. And we'll reference those as we talk, as we talk about um, the basin itself. So I wanted to just mention those. Of course, this is the backside of the Beargrass um, flood pumping station, one of the largest in our system. And uh, the flood protection system wraps around the northern and uh, south and southwestern portions of the, of the, of the city and, and the county. Interestingly enough, it actually begins right there at Dresher Bridge. So if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with those two structures that you see to the left as you go down Dresher, Dresher Bridge, those are gates one and two in our flood protection system, and that is the easternmost point uh, in that system. So just some, uh, just, just some pictures of those structures. Again, the, one, the picture on the right are those two structures uh, on Dresher Bridge. This is part of a, of a facility down on Melwood Avenue. It is also pretty interesting that I drove by as a young child, always wondering, what is that? I didn't have any idea what it was. It was very strange. It was built in conjunction with the flood protection system and the Beargrass Creek flood pumping station. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about the, um, the other CSO basins that are part of the consent decree. There are actually 10 now. Uh, Angela mentioned we went, we went through a modification in our plan. Um, and that, that number actually dropped from, I believe, 12 CS, CSO basins down to 10 CSO basins. And what you'll notice is that they are concentrated along our main outfalls, either to the Ohio River or along the tributaries of Beargrass Creek. Clifton Heights Basin is here. There are several others that discharge to uh, Beargrass Creek, the I-64 and Grinstead Basin, the Lexington and Payne CSO Basin, and the Logan Street CSO Basin. Can you slow down the speech I'm sorry. Gotcha. I'll try to slow down a little bit, was the comment. So the, a lot of people ask us how we arrived at the location of these CSO basins. Why, why would you pick this location for, to, to put this hole in the ground? Well, we did it because we, in terms of being economical, what we're trying to do is to group CSOs around these basins. So we're trying to control overflows from these combined sewer overflows into the, into the streams. And to do that, we have to physically connect these CSOs to these underground storage facilities. So by grouping the CSOs around a, a single storage basin, we are able to much more economically uh, meet those storage needs during wet weather. So in the case of the Clifton Heights CSO basin, there are four CSOs um, immediately near this site that made this site strategic for us in terms of being able to put the, the storage on this site. As you can imagine, if you're working in downtown Louisville, there aren't a lot of open, available tracts of land for this purpose. So that was another challenge as well, trying to find land that was open, available, it was strategic enough and close enough to the CSOs that would actually serve the function that we needed. And I haven't gotten to that yet. <laughs> this is just a, a table that gives you some sense of the volume of, of combined waste that leaves these CSOs every year. 
So this second column, these are the CSOs that we have numbered through the city. There are over 100 CSOs in our, in our system. Those are locations where combined um, waste, combined stormwater and wastewater can exit our system and drain into either a tributary of Beargrass Creek or the Ohio River. So at these four locations, these are the annual overflows in millions of gallons that leave our system at those, at those CSOs. So annually, we would expect about 75 million gallons of combined waste to leave our system and drain into a creek or a river. So that's really the problem that we're trying to address with, with this basin and with the, the series of projects in our combined system in general. Did that answer your question? I, I did list five, and the, the last one is actually has a zero discharge, so I'm not really counting it. It is it is on the on the original uh, chart for that project. Are any of these fresh I tell you what, if we could hold questions, th this presentation is pretty short. If we could hold questions until we're done with it, I'll be happy to to, to address all those questions. I want to make sure that we can capture the questions uh, for the cameras as well. So again, this is just a schematic of what this basin might look like in terms of the footprint on the site there. Uh, as you may know, this piece of property is currently owned by Metro government. MSD does not own the property, so that's something that we, would, we will need to uh, address with Metro government get, and purchase that property from them. But essentially what we're proposing to do, um, these are the, they're, they're, there's a CSO here, CSO here, these blue dots are CSOs. So those are two, and then we have one down here on Melwood. And we have one little further down here on Millwood by the, um, by the Beargrass Creek Flood Pumping Station. So those are the four CSOs that we're trying to capture the overflows from direct to this basin to be stored. And then after the rain event stops and we have available capacity in our sewers, we can pump the, the sewage from this basin back to the sewers for treatment at our treatment plant as opposed to being discharged into the streams, which, which is what happens today. This is Dresher Bridge, okay. Brownsboro Road, Melwood Avenue. Here's our Beargrass pumping station. Did that get you oriented? The, 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 I mentioned earlier that there were two existing sewers that were built back in the early 1900s. Those are, those are these two sewers. The blue line is the larger sewer that I showed you the pictures of. This salmon colored line is, is the smaller 36 inch line sewer. So those two sewers are still there. They're still in service. And those are the sewers that we're going to, to, to provide relief into the storage basin as part of the project. So again, just some pictures. The, the larger picture on your left, if you, if you turn down Dresher Bridge and you look to your left, you will see these two gate structures that I mentioned earlier. Those are gate structures over those two original sewers, the 36 inch and the larger 108 inch sewer. And those are part of the flood protection system. They allow us to close those gates during flooding events to protect the city from, from, from flooding. The basin itself will be located below those two structures down in that valley to the left below those gate structures. So here's the, here's the general background that we know going in here. And again, this is pretty conceptual at this point. The original um, modeling that we did showed us that we needed to build a basin with a volume of about 4.28 million gallons. So that's the volume that we need to be, a, be able to collect from the overflows from those four CSO locations. Now, as Angela mentioned, we continuously recalibrate those models. We have some indications that that, that size is going to jump up a little bit. Nothing dramatic, but it's going to jump, uh, jump up probably above that 4.28 million gallons. So in the next presentation that we come out and talk to the community, that, not, that, that number may differ a little bit. So I just want to be on record of saying that. And our commitment with all these CSO basins is that you saw early, in the earlier slide that a lot of these CSOs discharge 20, 30 times every year. We are required by the consent decree to minimize the times that these CSOs overflow on a project by project basis. So for this particular project, our commitment to EPA is that during a typical year, these CSOs would not discharge more than four times every year. So we are capturing and treating about 95% of all of the combined waste in our system through these, through these projects when we're done. 
I haven't mentioned cost yet, but this is, again, not one of the larger projects in our combined system, but it's still a $15 million project. They're very expensive. These are large, underground, cast-in-place concrete structures. They are covered, so all these will be covered and underground. They will have some type of a controlled building above them. It won't be a big building, but a, a building that's sufficient size to house all the electrical mechanical components that need to be up above uh, and out of the basin itself. But again, from a planning standpoint, we're not far enough along. We, don't, we can't tell you exactly what it's going to look like. What we'd like to get tonight is input from the community about well, how we can make this fit better into the community, into your neighborhoods. How to make that property, which right now appears to be not used very often from a public standpoint, in ways that we can enhance the property through this project and make it more, uh, have a better public use. So those, those are the goals. We obviously, we obviously are doing this because we have to meet regulatory compliance with the EPA. That's why, that's why we're here. But we want to do it in a way that's respectful to the environment. We want to do it in a way that's, that's affordable to our community. Angela mentioned that our, that our efforts in keeping rates low. Uh, we spend a lot of time making sure that we, that we are doing this as cost effectively as possible. Uh, to, I'd like to address the gentleman's comments earlier who spoke about separating our entire system. We could spend another eight hours having that discussion. Uh, separation of large systems as a whole uh, is, is, a, is a task that would probably quadruple or more our, our, our sewer rates, probably, probably more than that. So it's a, it's a huge initiative. Total separations of systems is not something that any large city uh, anywhere in the, in the United States would ever, would ever consider. So in terms of ways that we can enhance the project, and these are just uh, suggestions that we came up with internally. Um, for instance, th there may be a desire from the neighborhood or from the local community to have some type of a connectivity between Dresher Bridge and Melwood Avenue. That's something that we could easily consider and work into this project. It's a fairly large piece of land, and there'll be a large piece of the land that we will not use uh, permanently for the project. So we want to get input from the community about how that remaining land might be put to a public use. We've discussed with some of these basins the possibility of even having uh, the areas above the basins. Again, these are concrete below grade basins that will have a flat surface on top of them. We're discussing with some of these ba basins the possibility of having some type of a grass surface on them that could possibly be used for some type of passive recreation uses. So those are things that we're willing to consider. We haven't made any decisions about that in, on this particular project, but those are things that we'd like to get some input back from the community. So real quick, just to touch back on the schedule slide, this is the same slide you saw earlier. Uh, we hope to make a selection this summer in terms of a consultant that will help us through the design of this project. So we're trying to get as much input on the front end of that as we can. Once we make that selection, uh, we will be back, back out to the community to try to develop a, a stakeholders group to help us work through some of these issues with that consultant, with that design firm. So that's our, that's our current schedule. Angela may have had this in the slide, but we are interested in getting comments back from the public in terms of phone calls, emails, written comments tonight. Uh, snail mail is fine. And uh, we will all stick around for as long as we need to tonight to answer any questions that you all have. All right, we got a big stack of them. What other cities have storage basins? <clears throat> There's probably not a city in the eastern and southeastern United States that is not under a, a, a similar federal order to deal with SSOs and CSOs. So every city in, in the eastern and southeastern United States is going through the same thing. Angela showed you how we have met, how we are meeting our obligations in a more cost-effective way. One reason that we're able to do that is because the commissioners, uh, other cities are building large tunnels, underground tunnels, that are extremely expensive. And we are, actually, we are actually able to utilize the storage in these huge tunnels that the commissioners built in the early 1900s to meet some of those same needs. So the volume that we're uh, building with these underground storage basins is really just uh, pretty minimal compared to the, to the overall volume that we're able to get in our, as storage in our existing system. So other cities, are, are, other cities are using this same technology, either above ground or underground storage. Some cities are building deep tunnels. 
Uh, separation is an option when you have very, very small systems. Uh, once you get in, uh, into a system of, uh, of any size at all, that's not cost effective to do. So those are really the, the, the biggest options. You have to provide storage, you have to provide conveyance to a treatment plan, and if you, do, if you take that approach, then you have to provide treatment at the treatment plants. So the on-site storage of the, of the sewage is the most cost effective way for us to meet the goals in Louisville. And again, uh, by using the available storage in our existing sewers, uh, the size of these storage basins is really, is really pretty minimal compared to the storage that we're getting in line. So what is the capacity? Um, if, I, if I may, uh, the capacity of all of our CSO basins, is that? Oh, okay, great. Uh, basin life expectancy. Uh, anytime we build a large civil works project like this, we would expect they are designed with a life cycle of about 50 years. So, uh, Angela mentioned that the, you know, we are we rely every day on sewers that are over 100 years old. Uh, we have some sewers that date back to the Civil War prior to the commissioners. So, depending on the the quality of the construction of the facilities, depending on the materials that they use, and how well they're maintained. Uh, these facilities can easily last 100 years, but in terms of budgeting, we, we typically as assume a life cycle of about 50 years. Uh, what is the time to install? We probably have a, um, we would need probably two construction seasons in order to build this facility. So I'm, I'm guessing it's probably somewhere between an 18 month to a two year construction timeline. Uh, so it, it'll, it'll be torn up for, for at least some part of that two years. Yeah, the question was about have we done any exploratory work with the soils? We have not, and again, that will be part of the scope of work for our consultant once we get them on board. They'll need to do some geotechnical work, some rock soundings to figure out what, what type of soils we have to deal with there. It's going to be a huge issue in the, in the design of the facility. And then what is the cost to just replace the sewers? And I, I think that goes back to the, to the earlier gentleman's comments. Um, it's almost incomprehensible from an engineering standpoint to do a separation or a replacement of our, of our entire sewer system, nor would that necessarily accomplish the goals that we're trying to accomplish. Um, all of these large trunk sewers were built 100 years ago when the city of Louisville was largely undeveloped, and it would be almost incomprehensible to my mind to reconstruct some of the sewers that were built by the commissioners in the early 1900s. The southwestern outfall that I just showed you, the picture of the 28 foot tall sewer. Uh, when you look back at the construction methods that were used for that and the amount of disturbance that they needed in order to construct that, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. So to answer the question, I could not put a dollar amount on the cost. But all I could tell you is it would be uh, something that we would never consider in terms of just replacing every sewer. Uh, now, with that said, I will say that part of our consent decree involves how MSD maintains our system. So in the combined sewer system, we have to follow a group of uh, what's called nine minimum controls. So these are nine minimum efforts that EPA lines out for how municipalities are expected to take care of their combined sewer system. Uh, just for example, maintaining solids and flowables controls so that when the CSOs discharge to the creek, you're not carrying large amounts of trash and debris into the creek as well. That's just one example of one of the nine minimum controls. Out in the separate system, we have a, something called CMOM, which outlines how we maintain our separate sewer system. So obviously by maintaining these systems effectively and efficiently, we can prolong the life of all of them. So that's really a two-pronged approach. One is to meet the capital obligations of the consent decree with these large capital projects, but really the other is how we maintain our system. Any follow-ups to those questions? Yes, sir. The question was, does the CSO basin act like a settling pond? And to some extent it does. We will have some amount of, some small amount of solids that get into that basin. So when the basin is pumped down, uh, this basin and all the basins that we build will have a wash down procedure. So we will be washing down the floor of this basin, washing out any solids that accumulate in the bottom of it. So after every cycle, it will go through a self-cleaning phase and an inspection by staff. Every time it fills up, 
Every time it would fill up with sewage and gets pumped back down, it would go through a cycle where it washes down the floor, the floor and walls of the of the of the facility. And it's automated. It is automated. Yes. And that's 100% cool before it goes out. No. Any time there's any sewage in it at all, it will go through that cleaning cycle. It is pumped back into the, the question was where does the debris go when we clean the basin out? It is pumped back into the sewer system for treatment. So instead of going to the, to the, to the stream during wet weather, we store it and then we pump it out when we have capacity in our sewers and we send it for treatment. Very specifically, what's the route from this basin? The route from this basin is that it goes down, down the hill across Melwood Avenue in behind our Beargrass Creek flood pumping station and eventually gets to our Ohio River Interceptor, which goes down Main Street and around the entire northern and uh, northwestern corner of the city for treatment at our Morris Foreman treatment plant. So all the waste in the combined system is treated at our Morris Foreman treatment plant. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go on with the, the, with the questions here that I've got in front of me. Does the project covered Dresher Bridge? I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, yes, this, this does, I mean, the, the basin itself is right below Dresher Bridge, so Dresher Bridge is involved in the work of it. What's the proximity of the same road? How do you know this, just based on the design or the preliminary design, how many feet off the main road? I mentioned those two gate structures that you can see from Dresher Bridge. So those structures would be right here and right here. So it would really be, the basin is expected to be kind of just below that, that structure to the, le to the right. I think what she's asking is how far is the ground floor will that structure be located? Is it 100 feet? Is it 30 feet? Do you guys know what the numbers are? I don't have a scale with me or a map that I can scale, but my guess is we're probably talking somewhere in the neighborhood of three to 400 feet. Okay, I've got a question here. As you construct this, how much damage will occur to Dresher Bridge Avenue? Ninth District will be building a sidewalk on the east side this spring and summer. So that, that's exactly the kind of feedback that we're, that, we're, that we're trying to get both from the neighborhoods and from elected officials is what, what kind of other plans do you have for the area in addition to how, how, how can we make our project fit in better? Uh, there will absolutely be some damage to Dresher Bridge Road as part of this. Um, and we typically include a either reconstruction or at least a resurfacing of the roads as part of our construction contract. So we would want to encourage, uh, to the extent that we can, any other capital improvements along that, stre along that stretch of Dresher Bridge until we are done. And in fact, we might consider building some of those improvements ourselves if there's something that we can incorporate into our plan. The question was, will Dresher Bridge be closed down? And refresh my memory, is Dresher Bridge a one way in, one way out? No. Okay. It, it is unlikely that we would need to close Dresher Bridge. We would certainly, closing a road, uh, particularly one that is, is, I've been out here several times, it's, it's, it's busier than you would think it would be. Uh, so I would not expect that we would be closing Dresher Bridge uh, for any extended period of time. There, there, there could potentially be short, very short periods of time where it might have limited access to traffic, but I don't think we would ever expect to close it. Right. Yeah, I, I don't think we would expect to close it. I can't imagine any, nothing in my mind that would make us want to close it for an extended period of time. I don't, I don't think we would need to. Oh, the only way, yeah, yeah. Okay, how big will it be? Um, I assume that means footprint-wise, how large will it be? We won't know the final answer to that really until we get into more, a more detailed design. We can control to some extent the footprint of the facility itself uh, just by determining how deep we want to go, for instance. This is likely going to be a facility that we have to pump out of, so we have the ability to minimize the footprint and go deeper if there's advantages to doing that, either from a construction standpoint or from an impact to the environment standpoint. Um, just, uh, just based on how some of these other basins are being sized, my guess is this may be something in the neighborhood of um, 200 feet by 100 feet in terms of the dimension of it, and again, that's just an uh, off-the-cuff guess, but somewhere in that range is, is what I would expect, I think. How many trees will come down? Uh, pretty typical question. People are always concerned about trees. Uh, 
One of the, one of the constraints with this site is, though, although, is although it's big enough for the basin itself, it doesn't leave us with a lot of room for construction, staging, and laydown, which is something that, we, that is very, very necessary to us when we're building these types of projects. Again, the contractor's going to be here for between 18 months and two years. He'll, he'll need a large area, as large an area as he can find, really, to lay down his construction and uh, stage his materials. So my guess is that we will likely be clearing as much of this lot as we can. Uh, a lot of this growth is um, not necessarily the, the, the most attractive growth. Some of, a lot of us volunteer. <laughs> And my, my, my gut is that we would probably want to clear as much of that as we could and come up with, with a revegetation, a replanting plan for those areas when we're done. What would it look like at the surface? Was a. Yes. No, we, we, are, we will not be taking any residential homes as part of this project. Uh, what will it look like? Um, this is something we won't know the answer to until we get uh, a designer on hand and, ha and actually have some conceptual drawings put together. Uh, as you know, that lot really falls away pretty quickly from Dresher Bridge below those gate structures. And our basin will need to be up out of the floodplain. So, uh, what, what, what we will be creating, I imagine, is behind those gate structures, instead of having that steep drop off into the valley, you will have a, we will be constructing basically a flat uh, plateau uh, in order to get that basin uh, as we need it. So in terms of how we uh, treat that aesthetically, how we, if, we, if we put a grass surface back on it, if we fence it off and don't let anybody get to it, those are all issues that we'll, that we'll work through as we get through design. We haven't made any decisions about that internally. And we hope when you all do this, you don't leave it bare concrete as solar heats in the heat of the air. Did you do get some sort of uh, green discovery on that? Yeah, the comment was about the uh, heat island effect and, and the recommendation not to leave it a concrete pad. I can almost guarantee you that that would not happen. Uh, what controls will be in place for uh, release of odor? Uh, next to trees, odor is probably our second biggest complaint, uh, and not really a complaint as much as it, as it is a concern. Everybody's concerned about odor. So we've built a couple of these basins that are open to the atmosphere that do not have a cover on them. Uh, we're getting ready to start construction of our first cover basin down at the Logan Street facility. If you've seen the, the demolition that's taking place on the old Metro Public Works site, that's where MSD will be building our first one of these CSO basins. So we are uh, learning going into it to some extent about how we're going to treat odors. I will tell you that from our engineering standpoint coming into the design of these in, in, our, in our original IOAP, we did not feel like there was the need for odor control based on what we have learned from other communities. We spent significant times up in Detroit and other surrounding communities who have built many of these large facilities. And in some cases, they have spent millions of dollars installing odor control equipment that they have never used because this is such a dilute water, a dilute waste, and it is stored for such a short period of time that there is essentially not any odor from it. Now that being said, uh, that is something that's difficult for the public to believe because we all know it stinks. So in the, the first, the Mutual Basin uh, project that you all may have heard about, the large open air basin out off Produce Lane, uh, we did agree to put odor control in at that facility, so if that is operational and the odor control is in place. And I suspect with these CSO basins, we will take a similar approach. We will have some type of odor control designed and installed at each one of these facilities. We do not know what that is at this point, whether it's a chemical feed or some type of a carbon uh, treatment that uh, just maintains a negative pressure in the basin. So, but, but my guess is there will be some type of odor control here, even though, I'll be honest, from an engineering, engineering perspective, we're not sure it's necessary. I'm sorry, two people talk at the same time. Go ahead. If you do install odor control, is it a possibility to eliminate a top cover No. The question was, would we, consider, would, would we eliminate this as a covered basin? No. There, there's nothing that would cause this basin to be open. This will be a covered concrete basin. Your question? Okay. So what happens when the CSOs overflows is the question. Well, our goal is when the CSOs overflow that they will drain into this basin instead of to the creek. 
So we, we are, have a huge benefits in water quality in the streams and we can eliminate those CSOs discharging to the creeks and to the river. So the CSOs will overflow, the basin will contain that, that overflow volume, and when the sewers recede and we have available capacity in the sewers and at the treatment plant, we'll pump it back into the sewers for treatment at, at our more former plant. I want to be clear about some, one other issue here. We are not closing these CSOs. So the, the over 100 CSOs that I mentioned in our system, we're not eliminating them. We're not closing them. We are not eliminating their ability to discharge into the, into the creeks. What we're doing is minimizing the frequency by a great deal, the number of times per year that that, that, that would have to happen. The fact of the matter is when we, when we have some of these very, very intense storms that we have, the August 2009 event is a good example. The sewers have to have a place to relieve themselves because there's not a system in the country that, that is designed to carry those types of flows. So uh, th those CSOs will not be closed. We're just minimizing the number of times that they'll be able to, to discharge. Uh, I'm a little confused. Like, you said there's a CSO and there's a basin and there's a CSO basin. Are those all the same thing? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. A CSO, and there was a picture, Angela went through the description of a CSO in her presentation, so maybe we should back up just a second and talk about uh, what a CSO is. A CSO is a combined sewer overflow. So it is a place in our combined system that during wet weather, it is designed to discharge into the creek. So when the, when the, when the sewers contain a large amount of storm water, of clean water, they are allowed to discharge into either the Ohio River or into one of the tributaries of Beargrass Creek. So during wet weather, those are permitted discharge by the EPA. It is part of our system and part of our permit. So this is the large trunk sewer that Angela mentioned that the commissioners built the discharges either to the river or to Beargrass Creek. This is the interceptor sewer that, that was built to convey dry weather flow to the treatment plant. During heavy rain events, when the capacity of this interceptor sewer is exceeded, the wet weather flow jumps this weir and drains out to the creek as it did before. That is a permitted wet weather discharge. That is a combined sewer overflow. Can you give us the dimensions of They vary widely. Angela showed you the picture of the southwestern outfall. That is one of the largest in our system. The, the, you, you can find one all size, all different sizes, but the, the picture in, in my slide did show a picture of one of, the, of one of the combined sewer overflows that was built by the commissioners. Uh, this is an example of one that is along the south fork of Beargrass Creek, along the, cha the concrete channelized portion of Beargrass Creek. Where is that uh, this is up near Schiller Avenue, I believe. This is one of the larger ones. Uh, but there are, they, they vary, this is large, we have some that are, that are very small pipes, so. Well, you, I can walk into the into the side of that, and probably not hit my head. So it's a it's a big opening. With this uh, basin that's going to be installed, that's going to eliminate the basin uh, watershed that services some of the water that goes into the rainfall for this whole area of residences and surrounding. How will that be addressed? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yes. So, so the question was, how will the basin impact the, the function of the stormwater system as it is there today? It, it really. On just the site itself, you mean? On our site, on the site where we're building the basin? Yeah, you're okay. The that so the, the question was, how, how do we address the issue of the the floodplain storage is part of the issue there, I think, probably. It, it is floodplain. So how, how is MSD dealing with the, the impacts and the change to that natural pattern on the site where we're building the basin? And it's really a, probably a three-phased answer. Um, 
One, as part of MSD's responsibilities in the community, we are, we are the permittee for the municipal separate storm sewer system, the MS4 system. MSD administers that permit countywide. And as part of that, part of our, our latest permit, there is a requirement that any development that is over an acre uh, is required to capture and treat the first six tenths, of, uh, six tenths of an inch of rainfall that falls on that development. MSD is not exempt for that requirement. So uh, MSD will be installing those water quality practices as part of this project. Uh, MSD is also a leader in green infrastructure. We, we are investing almost $50 million in, under this consent decree in green infrastructure in our combined sewer system. And if you're not familiar with how that, the, the function of green infrastructure, when we refer to green infrastructure, it is from a stormwater quality and quantity standpoint. So most of the practices that we use with green infrastructure in, in MSD service area in the combined sewer area involves trying to take stormwater and infiltrate it directly into the ground as opposed to it running off. Uh, it's a very, very effective tool, particularly in the central and western parts of the city where we have a pretty shallow uh, sand and alluvial layer that drains very, very well. So any place that we can take stormwater and direct it into the ground and keep it out of our combined sewer system, we can minimize the size of some of these large storage basins. So that's part two. I'm, I'm not talking about water coming through the sewer pipe. I'm talking about water coming through the sky. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and the water coming from the sky is how uh, we will deal with the water quality issue through the MS4 uh, permit. We will, Correct. The, the question was, will the project help watershed or have any impacts on the overall watershed quality? It will have a negative impact. It will not have a negative impact. It will, it will have a neutral impact at worst. Uh, but this is a... Water, I think the thing that we need to understand here is that uh, it's a question about water quality and how the basin will or won't impact water quality in, in, the, in the watershed. This is a huge watershed. If you, if you follow this watershed up Brownsboro Road, it goes almost up to the reservoirs. And uh, so it, it drains a huge, huge area. So any one project in this watershed will have a neg negligible effect on water quality. MSD's goal and our desire and our commitment is that we will use practices to make sure that we will be responsible in how we restore this site in terms of water quality and uh, vegetation. Yeah, this project will have no impact on how the, the, re the, the remainder of this watershed functions during rain events. The, the question was, why did we choose this location? And I, I, I tried to cover that earlier, but it's essentially a, a, a product of a couple of different things. One is available land, and two is the proximity of that land to the existing CSOs in our system. So this piece of property sits in the middle of four of these CSOs. So it, it is strategic from that standpoint in terms of us being able to get the, the flows from the CSOs to that basin. Yes. Yeah, the question was about, was about wetlands. Uh, there's a couple of issues about wetlands and flood plan that we probably should mention. Uh, we have not done a formal delineation of this area for wetlands. That will be done as part of our design. Uh, if there are areas that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers consider to be wetlands, and they are the regulatory, the regulatory agency for wetlands, not MSD, uh, we would have to mitigate those disturbances to the wetlands. So that's, that's one thing. The second is also that, as I said, this is just outside, the, the, the proposed location of this basin is actually outside of the area that is protected by the MSD's flood protection system. So it, it is a flood plain as well. Um, 
Among our other duties, we are also the, administer for the, local, the administrator for the local floodplain ordinance in Jefferson County. We are not exempt from those regulations either. So we will have to meet the terms of the floodplain ordinance in terms of mitigating for any fill that we place in the floodplain. So uh, MSD is not immune from any of the things that any developer in town is, is asked to do. And, and this site will be challenging in terms of floodplain and, and possibly in terms of wetlands and, and, and other issues. The question was, with MSD leaving this concrete tank, are we going to leave the rest of the vegetation intact? Uh, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, we are not going to commit on the, on the front end that we will be able to maintain any of the vegetation on site outside the limits of the basin because of the, the space that we need for construction activities, for, for staging. Uh, we are also not planning on leaving this as a bare concrete lid, as I mentioned earlier. Our intent is to have the, this serve as some type of a green function, whether that is grass, some type of a, of a, of a prairie. Um, we have lots of options about how we dress up the, the lid of this thing, but it will not be a concrete uh, parking lot. So that, that is not our intent here, and that's not what we're, what we're proposing to do with uh, the other basins in this immediate proximity. Let me borrow this. Take it. Okay. I think I can answer, don't go too far, I think I can answer one of these questions is about the area and what's drained to that. Here's the basin. Here's two inputs from these large sewers. So the question about the area and the water that's coming to that area and the water quality of that. Right now, everything is either going out to the creek through the, the stormwater runoff or it's getting in the sewer and coming back out through one of these three locations that are here going straight into this dresser bridge right here or right here through one, this place here. And this is the old mucky black water that you will find there after rain events. And that's all that CSO that's coming through here. That's the result of all of that in the watershed. So when this basin goes in, it's going to take all of this that's coming through that area. A lot of it's coming straight from those homes, straight into the sewer that's overflowing now. It's going to collect all of that and it's going to hold it in this basin. And instead of letting it go out, it's going to put it into the sewer and send it back down to the treatment plant when the water succeeds and we can treat that. So in terms of the water that was making it, the storm water that is making it into the sewer that was becoming sewer overflow, this will help. The water that's running across the land that's going straight into the creek, this will not help because that water's not getting in the sewer. This is, this is to take care of that water in the sewer. And yes, this is the low area, but this is where all that was going anyway and going straight out to the creek. So we're, we are putting the structure in there and we're catching all of that and holding it instead of releasing it and putting it back into the system and take it to the treatment plant and give it full treatment later on. So to state it another way, you're not addressing the groundwater flood. Is what you're saying. Not we, we are not addressing yeah. stormwater quality in the entire basin. That's right. With a structure like that, taking up that many cubic feet of capacity, you could create a problem for the neighborhood surrounding it. From a stormwater perspective, no. From a, rain, from a rainwater, stormwater perspective, that water in that area that was coming through that creek is... Yeah. From the sky to the that goes, yes, that's going in there. A lot of it is going, it's getting in the catch basins in the road. Those catch basins are connected to the sewer. That sewer goes to this creek. And so it's gonna be transferred into this big hole in the ground. It's gonna be held. It's gonna be kept out of the creek. And once the storm recedes and there's flow capacity back in the sewer system and at the treatment plant, we're gonna convey that to the treatment plant and be treated. Right now it's running straight out to the creek and untreated whatsoever. So this is gonna improve your situation. In fact, we've modeled all of this. We've modeled the water quality. We know the work that we're gonna do is gonna improve the water quality in this area of Beargrass Creek, along the river, everywhere else we're doing this. We wouldn't be doing this and spending your money, our money, if we weren't going to improve the situation. We are not, we can promise you, we are not gonna come out here and leave a situation worse than the situation that already exists. 
Number one, we made a promise to the federal government, so we're, we're also making that to you, that we're going to be able to do that. So, because I'm the one that has to sign for all of this, I certify under penalty of law, and so you can rest assured that that's not going to happen. What happens when the basin, basin gets full? There are times by our consent decree, by our agreement with the federal government, that we know and they understand that we will have rainfalls and, and conditions in our sewer that we cannot tr handle that, that volume. And under those conditions, those CSOs would trigger today, then, just like they do today. So during those times of heavy rain, when the, when the, when the volume of this basin is not sufficient to handle it, those CSOs will continue to discharge to the river and to the Beargrass Creek. No, because the, the, the overflow is not at this basin. The overflow will remain at the CSOs. That's the only place in our system where, 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 where those overflows will be permitted to occur. So it can't overflow at this basin. That's correct. And it will not, uh, if anything, it's going to be better because it's already a wetland. And I assume there's going to be some gradient in there to help transfer that water onto the river. As, as far as the water that falls from the sky onto this site, the, the only change will be how the lot is graded. It's, it's a grass lot today. We are going to put as much of this back in grass as we can when we're done. So from that standpoint, it, it's not going to be any different. It certainly won't create any problems that aren't there today. We would expect that it would. But we did make, we, again, if we go back to the modeling that we did, 98% of the water that falls in this area that was already there, 98% of that water, we're going to capture that. It's not captured today. 98% of the water that falls onto that basin and goes into that sewer that's in there now, 98% of that we are going to capture and we're going to treat. So that is not happening today. That watershed right. drains through those pipes. Right. And so 98% of that we're going to capture and we're going to treat. 98%. That's not what's happening today. It's all going untreated for the most part. Okay, I'm going to. Do we have a deadline to be out here? I think 8 o'clock. How are we doing on time? And we have a whiteboard now if we need to draw. Okay. I'm going to move on to these questions because we will not get through them if we don't. Uh, if anybody has questions about that issue when we're done, we'll be happy to stay and, and speak to you for, for as long as it takes. Uh, questions about land stability above the site after you clear the, the land, um, fears of mudslides. So we've all seen that on the news and that's heavy on our minds. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you saw the pictures on those original construction photos and go out there today and look at the rock bluffs that are there to the, to the, to the right on Dresher Bridge, uh, we will be excavating large, much of this, I suspect, uh, in rock. So in terms of mudslides and land stability, we, 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 we would never expect to have those types of land stability problems when we're, when we're excavating rock. Uh, we will obviously be spending a lot of time from the, from the engineering perspective making sure that we reestablish something that is stable in the long term. Um, have, also have a comment about replanting better trees and possibly working with Metro Parks. Uh, I did mention that we expect to clear a good part of this lot. Uh, we will be willing to have discussions with the neighborhood about replanting efforts and in fact what the, the community thinks those replanting efforts should look like. Um, Metro Parks may or may not be interested in, in working with us on this particular site. Uh, they're not interested in taking ownership of, of any additional uh, maintenance responsibilities that, that they don't already have, but uh, we, we partner with them frequently and they would certainly be available to, to provide input about what types of trees we might consider uh, as part of our replanting plan. That's a blank one, so that's good. <laughs> would MSD pay for the improvement on top of the basin, i.e. a playground, tennis courts, community gardens? Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, one of the things we want to get input from the community is uh, how can we utilize the site when we're done uh, 
uh, that is a benefit that, you, that we don't have today. Um, now that, that is not to say we're giving the public free access to our facilities, uh, but, but we are trying to, when we can, uh, design these in a way that, so that there is some type of public use where it's appropriate. Something we won't be able to answer specifically until we get pretty deep into design, but it is a conversation that we're having routinely with these other basins that are in the, that are in the pipeline. Were the caverns ever considered for storage? Oh, okay. Angela's already answered that. Oh. Uh, I assume the caverns you're talking about are the ones near the zoo. Uh, they were not, and they, they weren't uh, largely because of, of, the, of the location. Uh, again, the CSOs in our system, are most of them are miles and miles from the caverns, mostly on the northern and northwestern uh, part of the city. So in order to get the flows from these CSOs, from these large sewers to the caverns, uh, it wouldn't be an economical way to, to provide that storage, although it's a, great, it's, a, it's a great thought. Please explain two slides of Clifton Height. Is that, are those two specific slides we have questions about? Okay. What is the storage basin made from? Is it covered? It is covered. It will be made of reinforced concrete, we, we expect. Tarp. How much ground cover will be on top of it was the question, and the answer is we don't know. Uh, a lot of that will depend on what we actually want that surface to look like. You know, if, we, if we just want grass to grow, then we may not need a lot of uh, uh, dirt, for instance. Depending on what, the, it's really going to depend on what that what that use is. Uh, target completion date I mentioned earlier is the end of 2018. Uh, are other basins mentioned this close to residential or business locations? Uh, yes. Uh, these basins are scattered throughout the community. I showed you the CSO basins on one of the slides in my presentation. We've got another slide that shows the, the basins, some of the basins out in our separate sewer system as well. There's about a half a dozen of those. And uh, if you look at the location of those facilities, some of them are very close to residential and particularly businesses. So uh, this is not unusual really uh, in terms of how close we are to those types of, uh, t types of neighbors, which is really is why we take working with the neighbors so seriously on the, on the front end, trying to make sure that we, uh, that we can come up with a project that we can all uh, live with. Where are they specifically located in Jefferson County? Uh, we've got a map here, and I'll be happy to share that map with anybody who wants a, a, a copy of that map. My, my presentation mentioned that there were six properties affected by this basin. I, I think what we're trying to indicate is really just the adjacent properties that we're going to be working around. Uh, I think we will only be acquiring a single piece of property from Metro government in terms of what MSD needs in ownership to build what we're building. Does the engineering plan address potential impacts to the area properties and structures if structural integrity of the storage, including earthquake? So the, the, the simple answer is that there are, there are design standards that, uh, from an engineering standpoint, we have to follow in terms of how, structural, how structures are designed and what they, are, what they have to be, able to, to be able to stand in terms of seismic activity, structural loads, dead loads, live loads. So all that will be part of the, of the design process and will be done by a licensed engineer in Kentucky. How will you vent this project? That's a great question. Uh, if you can imagine a great big hole in the ground, imagine this room filling up with water at a pretty uh, high rate. Uh, we're displacing a large amount of air when that happens. So we have to provide for some type of ventilation from these basins in those conditions. So when it's filling up, it'll be wanting to, to, to move air out of the basin. When it's draining, it will, be, it will be drawing air into the basin. So some of the discussions about odor control will go hand in hand with how we deal with the ventilation issues. And we haven't, we haven't addressed any, any of those issues. We've got a few options with how we do them. And part of it is really uh, has to do with how you plan to deal with odors and if you think you need to deal with odors. And that was my question. I'm concerned with the smell, the, the clear gas in the cat will uh, maybe affect the Army too. Right. Odor is understandably a big concern. Um, I always want to point out to people that remember that today this waste is going directly into the streams. So it, it's not that it's not in our community on the ground already. We are simply storing it for treatment. So from that standpoint, that damage is occurring today. And if you don't smell it today, 
I'm going to assume you're not going to smell it when we're done, but we are going to take every measure to make sure that this basin will not contribute to any odor problems that are in the area. From the sewers, yeah, yeah, and there's, yeah, there there are areas in the county, uh, really anywhere in the combined system. Although a, a lot of the the catch basins that lead to our combined sewer are trapped, just like your sink is trapped or your toilet is trapped. Uh, not every catch basin in our system is trapped, and not every fixture is trapped. So it's not unusual to be able to get um, odors from the sewer system. Um, Again, what we, are, what we will be looking at in this particular issue is, is how it relates to this specific project and, and make sure that the, the odors coming from this project are not a problem. Well, the ones that are, the question was how do we vent the ones that are in operation? The ones that are in operation are, are actually open to the atmosphere. So they don't, they don't have that issue. They're vented naturally to the atmosphere because they have no cover on them. Um, the first one that we're actually moving to construction with is the one at, at Logan Street. So we will draw some experience from that when we get into construction with it and uh, learn, for, learn from that. Again, most of the other communities that we've been to do not, have not installed odor control or if they have, have not used them. So um, we try to keep that in the back of my mind because it is an expensive proposition, not just from an initial, an initial capital standpoint, but from a long-term operations cost as well. Well, what happens after 50 years, the gentleman that, that, that stood up and spoke earlier was talking about how we needed to replace our entire sewer, our entire sewer system. And uh, he brings up some interesting points. And, and, and just as an example, what happens when our southwestern outfall that's been in service for over 100 years fails? Um, so the, the same question that MSD goes through every day in terms of how we, how we make our long-term capital plans and capital investments, we have to prioritize um, where we spend those dollars. Uh, and we're looking right now at, our, at a 20-year facilities plan that is looking past the consent decree and trying to lay out how, we're going to, how, how we need to address those very issues uh, past the consent decree in 2024. We recognize that we have an, an aging system, particularly in the downtown area, that will need attention. It needs attention today. Um, but we are, are not, while we're trying to get through a federal consent decree, an $850, $850 million burden on our ratepayers, we are not going to aggressively begin spending an, 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 another great deal of money on those systems while we can still maintain them and use them. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's a great question, and it's simply a matter of how much capital we have coming in and how you prior, prioritize those replacements. That's correct. The primary goal is to keep raw sewage out of the river and creeks. That's right. That's exactly right. Is $850 million in 2009 dollars enough? So um, we actually, the $850 million, our, our CFO is in, the office, is in the audience, so he's chuckling at this. So when we laid, our, laid out our consent decree, we actually laid it out in real dollars as, as we progressed through the consent decree. So in 2000 five dollars I think our consent decree would have been actually uh, something under seven hundred million dollars if we could have built it all in one year and, and have been done with it so we, we do have it spread out in terms of the value of money uh, as, as we build it uh, question how often are clay pipes replaced uh, the simple answer is that we inspect our system on a pretty aggressive schedule right now uh, we inspect every stick of pipe in our system every ten years which may sound like a long time, but it's a pretty aggressive schedule that we've agreed to as part of our consent decree and as part of those obligations to maintain the system. Um, so we have a pretty good sense for what the condition of most of our infrastructure is in terms of our pipes. So by doing that, we're able to prioritize which pipes need to be replaced and which, and, and which ones first. So it, it helps us lay out our capital expenditures. Uh, from, from a practical standpoint, uh, many of our facilities uh, will, will be in service to failure. I mean, that's that's... You don't want to necessarily plan uh, for, your, for your system to, to, to act that way, and we would love to get further out ahead in terms of capital investments and replacements of our sewers. Um, but you'll see a sewer, you'll see a street somewhere in, in, in downtown Louisville torn up almost weekly because of, of an emergency repair that MSD needs to make because of a failure that's occurred. That, that failure can occur because of uh, uh, an adjacent water main that might have leaked. Anytime a water main breaks downtown, it typically impacts our sewer system. 
Um, some of them just fail because of age. We have a lot of old brick sewers in our system, and they will not last forever. So our, our goal is to maintain them and leave them in service as long as we can and get the benefit out of them uh, by, by maintaining them. The question was, when a site fails, do we, do we separate the sewers or, or do we put back what was there? The short answer is we put back what was there because these are typically point repairs. There are single points of failure in the system, and it doesn't allow you the opportunity to do any separation. You simply have to fix what was there prior. Can you explain a specific project that helped to reduce the SSOs in the first older areas? For example, did MSD create a big catch basin or something else? Um, we did a tremendous amount of work, as Angela said, in the early years of our consent decree out in the separate system. Uh, anybody who's familiar with the Beechwood Village area, we had, uh, that was, we, we had four, pro four areas of town that were called the Big Four SSOs. There, there were four areas in our separate sewer system whose annual discharges made up about 70% of our total annual overflow volume in our separate sewer system. So the EPA targeted those areas first. They mandated that we fix those problems first. So the work we did in Beechwood Village, uh, we built several large interceptor sewers and storage basins in the Hikes Lane area that eliminated the other three areas, the, the, the other three of the big four SSOs. Uh, so we've done virtually any type of work that you can imagine from in the Beechwood Village area, we, we were inside every single home, basically replumbing the homes and rebuilding that entire system from the sink to the mainline sewer. Uh, we've got large storage basins that we built. We bought, we built large conveyance systems, uh, and we've also invested heavily in wet weather treatment capacity at one of our treatment plants down on Lower River Road, the Guthrie Treatment Plant. So it, it's it's really a combination of these different issues that have allowed us to do it cost effectively. And uh, as Angela said, we, we've we've been successful in meeting all the obligations in terms of SSO eliminations to date. We're on track schedule-wise and slightly under budget, so we're very happy there. Does MSD pay for the homeowner to remove downspouts or sump pumps? Uh, Angela uh, had on one of her slides, she didn't talk about it a lot, but we do have a program called the P&P program. It's a plumbing modification program. So if you have a history of sewer backups in your home, we have a program that will pay 100% of the cost of installing a backflow prevention device in your basement that will, that will keep the sewage from backing up in your house. Uh, now, hand in hand with that, if you have a sump pump that's connected to the sanitary sewer, it would be disconnected by that same, by that same effort. In, in terms of paying for downspout disconnections, we, we, we did have a pilot program going for a short time that encouraged property owners to down, disconnect downspouts, and we contributed to the cost of that. Uh, that, pro, that. That pilot is over, but we are looking at introducing some language into our rates and rentals this year that would bring that, um, pol that program back to life district-wide, district-wide within the limits of the combined sewer area. Um, so it, it is something we're interested in doing. It's something that's very inexpensive to do and uh, allows us to get uh, you know, face to face with customers and talk about what, what some of those issues are. Most of the work that we're doing in basements in terms of el eliminating sump pumps is on a voluntary basis at this point. So the more time that we can get uh, with our customers and talk about some of the issues that, that are that's happening on their property, uh, the better off we'll be. What are the high-tech techniques that Atlanta is using? Is that a joke? <laughs> they're going to jail. That's what they're doing. Um, I don't know that there's very much high-tech about Atlanta. I don't, I don't mean to um, down what they've done. They've invested a huge amount of money in rebuilding the sewer system in Atlanta and creating some of the large, deep tunnels that I've talked about, um, built some huge treatment facilities. And if you look at the national rates for sewer, Atlanta's on the far right side of that. I mean, they're, they're probably four times what MSD does in terms of what their homeowners are paying for, for sewer rates. So I, I would not hold Atlanta up as a stepchild of, you know, this is how you, this is how you do a consent decree because that's, uh, that's not where we're going. How can I find out exactly which CSO on my property drains to? Um, how many CSOs would a Clifton Heights CSO basin serve? So as I mentioned, there are four CSOs that the Clifton Basin serves. Um, if, if you want to see someone after about your address, if you want to give us your address, we can tell you specifically where your property drains to, which CSO catchment that you're in. And it's, it's a pretty interesting uh, exercise. If you, if you haven't been through it, it's, it's something that's, that's useful to, to know. OK, that's another question about the six properties that are affected. We may get through these. 
Do you come and speak to groups? Yeah. <laughs> we love to. If you've got a group that would, uh, would like to have someone to come out and speak to us, to you, we, we, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, we actually have, you know, probably a hundred different presentations on almost any topic you could think about in terms of stormwater, wastewater, flood protection, water quality, floodplain ordinance, erosion control ordinance. Uh, pick a topic and give us a shout and we'd be happy to come up, make, make a, arrangements to come out. What's the best way to dispose of liquids like spoiled milk? Spoiled milk is fine to put down your sink. Um, Angela was, was talking about the things that you shouldn't put down your toilet or down your sink. Uh, any kind of a liquid that is not grease is, is fine. So spoiled milk down, down the sink is fine. Last one, maybe. Okay, the question about what a weir is, CSOs, okay, so we, I think we've explained the CSO. Does everybody understand what a CSO is at this point? So a weir is essentially just a fixed uh, gate, if you will, that, that controls the elevation that the, the, the combined sewer can back up before it overtops the weir and goes out to the sewer. So you, Angela mentioned the, the wall or the dam that's built in, in, inside the invert of that old large trunk that forces the dry weather flow into the pipe that goes to the treatment plant. So only during wet weather when you have large flows coming down that large trunk sewer will that flow jump the weir, go over the weir, and go out to the river. Does that make sense? Maybe? Any other questions? No, you cannot take the clipboards home. Those are your, your, your rates will go up if you take the, the clipboards home. <laughs> yes, sir. Huh? Uh, where are your plans for those areas? Uh, the map I showed earlier did show the, the location of the other proposed CSO basins. So the ones that are in the immediate vicinity of this are the one behind Jim Porter's. That's the one we call the I-64 and Grinstead Basin. There is a proposed CSO basin on, on or near the old River Metals site. Uh, that we call that the Lexington and Payne Basin. We have the Clifton Heights Basin. We have uh, the Logan Street Basin that is uh, going to construction this year. Is that the only ones in this immediate neck of the woods? I think it is. Yeah. Any, any, anything particular about those sites, or? Both of, both of those have completion dates of December of 2020. So we have pushed both of those out to the very end of this obligation in terms of our work in the combined sewer area. Uh, we are actively working with uh, a group of stakeholders in the 64 and Grinstead area to try to um, use some techniques uh, that, that would allow us to shrink the size of that. That basin is not going away. It's still going to be a relatively large basin. Uh, but it is on track. Uh, we're we're going to have some other work done, we hope, in that watershed prior to going to construction. But it's, again, both of those completion dates are in December of 2020. Yes, ma'am. It, it will not impact it at all from my, from my perspective. And again, the problem here is that, as I mentioned earlier, Brownsboro Road is really built right up the throat of that old valley. So it's built up the low area of that valley with these large sewers underneath it. So whenever the capacity of these large sewers are exceeded, it has nowhere to go but back up out of the ground. So th this project, no, no, this, this basin would not have any impact on that. Uh, the question was, is this the only basin surrounded by residential? Um, Logan Street uh, Basin has quite a bit of residential across the street from it. Um, every one of them is going to be a little different. Some of them, some of them are, are completely surrounded by commercial. This, this, was, this, this is largely surrounded by residential, and some are a mixture of both. Um, one of the basins is proposed in Shawnee Park. So, We've got a lot of different stakeholders and a lot of different situations to work with and try to make, to make sure that we can fit these in uh, accordingly, basically with what the neighborhood, the, the characteristics of the existing surroundings are. So there's, there's some challenges, there's no question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
we expect that, that this will have pumps. We, have, and we, we won't have the final answer to that until we get into the, the detailed design, but most of these facilities are di designed so that they will fill up by gravity and then we will pump them out uh, when we need to drain them. Uh, now, where we can, if, if there were ever a scenario where you could have gravity flow in and gravity flow back out, that's what we would do. Uh, but my guess is that there, there will be pumps here. The question was about security, and the security of the site is really going to depend on how we finish the site. So, for instance, if we chose to fence the entire site off, and then I suspect security would be less of an issue than if, it's, than, than if a portion of it is open to the public. So a lot of those security issues will have to be addressed as we get into the detailed design and figure out exactly what it's going to look like, how it's going to be used, is there going to be public access to some of the property? So those are all issues we'll need to talk more about. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, and that's a that's a representation of the work that not only Louisville done, but everybody upstream of us has done too. So it's. And the other thing, if you want to reduce your sewage and your drainage bill, reduce your water. Yeah. yeah. You get less water, well, that's a, that's an interesting conversation that maybe we'll have a different night. If 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 you want a speaker to come out and talk about uh, reduced water usage, it has some interesting implications on sewer and drainage rates. Not necessarily the direction that you think they would go. So. Anything else? Okay, we'll wrap up. Thank you very much. <laughs>